You know, blockbuster stores and West Coast video stores and most of all, independent VHS rental stores, they were amazing places if you found the right one with really interesting people to talk to. And now that they're gone, well, there isn't like a Netflix place you can go and talk to the person at the cash register about what's good. We lost a lot when we gave up VHS. Well, we didn't give it up. It got taken away from it. I, actually, they were even making VHSs and VCRs four years ago. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but somebody was. On this show, we talk about the culture of VHS, what got lost, why people are still hanging on to certain VHSs, too. Oh, yes, yes, it is a lost civilization. We all lived in it, and now it's a lost civilization. Well, I mean, most of us lived in it anyway. I'm talking about the world of VHS, the world of video cassettes and video cassette recorders. Uh, and some of you out there are still living in that world. My son, if he could live in that world, would still be living in that world. So we're going to talk about it today. Uh, we're t we'll talk about the nostalgia for it, the degree to which it never really did go away, the things that it offered that are not offered by all the modern, theoretically more convenient uh, and technologically more sophisticated things that we have today. So who's going to do this with us? Well, uh, joining us uh, is uh, uh, Caitlin benson Allett, uh, Distinguished Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at Georgetown University and author of Killer Tapes and Shattered Screens, Video Spectatorship from VHS to File Sharing. Joining us, of course, is Sam Hatch, co-host of The Culture Dogs. They're on Sunday nights on WWUH. Sam's been on our show for all kinds of purposes over the years. Uh, joining us a little bit later will be Hank Paper, the former owner of Best Video in Hamden. Uh, he's a professor of film, television, and media arts at Quinnipiac University. Um, Caitlin, I'm going to have you get us rolling here. And I think maybe uh, just uh, as a reminder, as a seam setter to a visitor from outer space or perhaps to a 12-year-old person, how would you explain what a VHS was and, and what its period in American culture was? All right. So uh, for all of you aliens out there, once upon a time, people could only see films in movie theaters. And if they wanted to watch television, they had to do it when the show was being broadcast, what we now call appointment viewing. <laughs> And then in the mid-1970s, Sony rolled out this funny little technology called Betamax, about the size of a paperback book that, in their words, allowed you to watch whatever, whenever. A year later, their competitor, JVC, brought us VHS, and we were off to the races. People were renting cassettes to watch film history on their own schedules and recording the things that they loved on television to watch in the middle of the night when they should have been doing their homework, you name it. Right. And so there was, I mean, I'm I'm probably the, well, I'm definitely the oldest person on this TV show, on this radio show. And I remember missing TV shows. You could miss a TV show. And if you missed a TV show, you were sunk. You know, it come, might come on back. The same episode might come on in the summer as a summer rerun, and maybe you would see it then. But it was pretty easy to miss a TV show. And there was literally no remedy. I don't, I think it must be hard for people <laughs> who were not part of that era to grasp that. But there just was no such thing as doing anything else about it. Uh, so, yes, obviously VHS made uh, a huge difference. So, um, Caitlin, how did VHS triumph over Betamax? And then, I mean, the second half of the question is, what happened? Why aren't we still living in a VHS world now? Sure. There are two competing stories about how VHS uh, killed Betamax and a bunch of other competitors. In the early 80s, there were about a dozen different video formats all slogging it out to be number one. But VHS um, had one key advantage over Betamax early on. Um, it was you could dub tapes faster. You could reproduce tapes faster on VHS than you could on Betamax. And legend has it that uh, the pornography industry, which was discovering unforeseen riches um, among home media viewers, they backed VHS because VHS let them make more tapes faster. 
Hmm. And um, where porn goes, the rest of the video industry follows. The uh, the PG rated version of why VHS beat Betamax is that they were the first to come out with a four hour cassette, which allowed American viewers to record full football games on a single cassette. I'm not such a football fan myself, but I don't totally understand what the appeal would have been about holding on to a football game for posterity. It sort of seems like once you know the score. But again, I'm not a sports fan. As for why we're not uh, living in a VHS world today, you can blame your friendly Hollywood movie studios. <laughs> they were um, up in a lather from the day they heard about this whole home media thing that they would lose profits to piracy. They didn't want people copying their cassettes and uh, watching movies that they hadn't paid for. So they had this great idea in the 90s that if they just went digital, all that pesky piracy would go away. And so they created uh, the DVD consortium with a few different tech companies to come up with those shiny discs that we used for about a decade and a half at the beginning of this century. And they thought, this will do it. This will stop piracy. And of course, as we now know, in fact, they took the lid off of Pandora's box and um, and really, you know, to mix my metaphors, uh, gave turbo rockets to the pirates. I just want to say I am sure that I did record football games. Um, <laughs> and there's a, there used to be a great show called uh, Buffalo Bill that starred Dabney Coleman. It had all these great oh, wow, people yeah. on it, too. It had Joanna Cassidy and <laughs> Gina Davis. It was, her, I think, her first role. And he played this really horrible, repellent TV host uh, yeah. of a show in Buffalo, New York. And he was just a really bad person. And there was this terrific episode where he was he w- had some unnatural for him desire for human contact. And he wanted somebody to have dinner with him. And everybody at the station refused because they didn't like him and he hadn't been nice to them. And he went up to a guy who was working on a stepladder, some tech guy he'd probably never had a conversation with, got his name wrong. And then the guy, he said, well, you want to go out to dinner? And the guy said, no. He said, actually, I recorded last night's Buffalo Sabres hockey game, and I just made sure nobody told me the score all day. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to go home and watch it. And he goes, Sabres lost 3-2. Yeah, you want to go out to dinner? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that whole thing of recording sports is absolutely real. Sam, yes, uh, as Caitlin just described, another technology came along and displaced VHS. But VHS is still a thing, right? There's still people who love it, keep it, want it, have libraries of it. Why is that? And that's the thing about physical media. It's, it's created this whole uh, kind of personality of, of collector. It's the new evolution of having a library in your homes. It, what, what films you have on your shelf say something about you as a person. And once you have created something and, and made it, uh, eventually it'll it'll die from the ravages of time. But in the meantime, it's still there. It's still extant. And there are tons of these things because they were mass marketed tapes. And just about everything you could possibly want is out there somewhere. And it's been devalued so much for the most part, except for horror titles and other niche products, uh, that you can pick them up by the boatload for next to nothing. And it's there. So why not take it and watch it as long as you can deal with the fact that it's not 1080p or you know, 4K or anything like that. So you have to uh, temper your expectations. But uh, you, you have an entire film library and television library at your beck and call. The, um, so I take it you do. I do. I do. I, I collect a bit of everything. So yeah. I have quite a few VHS and, and laser discs and all sorts of things and still collect Blu-rays and UHDs. Right. So yeah. uh, and I, I, Carlos Mejia, who produced this episode, directed me to a, a Reddit page where there's just like people putting pictures up of they just bought eight v- v- video cassettes for, you know, a dollar or something and what the pictures are, what they are and everything like that. And I'm thinking, you know, that's basically something you're going to have to find storage space for. Space is, is always the issue uh, if you're a collector. But there's there's the the thrill of the the hunter collector. You know, we've got nothing to gather really anymore. Mm-hmm. So if you're a collector, it's the thrill of the hunt. There's always some obscure title out there that you can make space for, and it's just about getting out there in the trenches, in the thrift stores, in the flea markets, and trying to find that one obscure little item. And then, yeah, people definitely go on social media and they they brag about it. They probably (laughs) hold up their VHS tapes. There's a ton of VHS uh, exclusive membership groups uh, that you can find on Facebook. Just beware because some of them are a little – once you go down that rabbit hole, it goes pretty pretty deep and sideways. 
Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a big thing. So Caitlin, it's worth mentioning that not all VHS content did migrate over to this new format. Why was that? So sometimes it's um, because of rights uh, within the production itself. Music rights are a big stumbling block, but also in this country, you know, film, television, they're commercial industries. So you've got folks, you know, in the studios deciding what are the potential profits for something like uh, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, which is one of my Mm -hmm. favorite movies that has never come out on DVD, is not available for streaming. I've still got it on VHS and laser disc nice. um, and I think you know people have to have to make a decision for their corporation are we going to be able to to see ourselves in the black with this re-release and unfortunately for a lot of us who may be like more obscure titles who want to see some of those movies that we grew up with um, the bean counters have decided there weren't enough beans there and so they're not on Netflix they're not on Amazon Prime and they're never going to be if you want to see them, you need a VCR. So um, I, I have to, first of all, um, looking for Mr. Goodbar, I believe that's maybe our earliest encounter with Richard Gere, right? Isn't it it Richard is. Gere? It nice. absolutely yeah. is. So um, uh, I have to ask, Caitlin, what else do you own besides looking for Mr. Goodbar that you're willing to talk about? Ah, on VHS? Yeah. Let's see. Okay. So I have... Um, Todd Haynes's Karen Carpenter story, mm-hmm. uh, one of his very first movies, super cool, uh, embargoed by the Carpenter estate for unlicensed use of the music. And if you ask a lot of us, because um, Haynes acts out the Karen Carpenter's life story with Barbie dolls, <laughs> maybe a little bit irreverent, mm-hmm. um, but it had an amazing underground distribution on VHS. So you had to know someone who had a copy and was willing to dub it for you. I got a lot of Tex Avery cartoons um, still on VHS because that's how I found them as a kid, and I love them. And I'm also a huge fan of the direct-to-video horror movies of the 1980s. Um, Video made the 1980s horror renaissance possible. So if you want things like Killer Workout and you want to see them in the way they were intended, you've got to have them on VHS. I'm also supposed to ask you about something called The the Ring. (laughs) (laughs) So The Ring is, um, to me, it's the quintessential VHS movie, even though it came out in 2001. It was right at that moment when DVD had just overtaken VHS, and we could finally maybe kind of acknowledge how sort of creepy these ugly little black boxes were were and how you didn't always know where they came from, even when you got them at your local blockbuster. Mm. So if you got the ring on VHS, for those of you who still haven't seen it, I'll just say there's a scary little girl and a horrible videotape that kills you when you watch it. So the VHS copy of The Ring, when you got it, would start with her killer videotape before the previews, before the FBI warning, before anything. It was a stunt of distribution (laughs) that just isn't the same when you see it on streaming or see it on DVD. Sam is handing me a sealed copy of (laughs) The Ring on VHS. Oh, my God. Hold on to that. Hold on to it. I'm jealous. I've got an open copy and a sealed copy, just in case. Right. (laughs) Um, I just have to say one thing about the FBI warning, which is that I remember like a lot of a lot of my generation of baby boomers. I finally bought my parents a VHS player uh, and then uh, they didn't do anything with it. And so I would bring them tapes either that I owned or that I got from somewhere that I thought they would like. And then I I remember asking my mother about this. Have you watched any of these yet? And she said, I put one in and something about the FBI came on. I got very afraid and I turned everything (laughs) off. Um, So uh, now, of course, I'm that generation that'll be doing that kind of thing but uh but yeah it was it was a big deal all right so sam uh i'm almost scared to ask you what now that you've handed me <laughs> the ring <a> shrink wrapped <laughs> copy of the ring uh what else you own on vhs uh, other ring related things when the <laughs> ring 2 came out i actually have a ton of promo tapes that the studio put together with the cursed video on it alone <laughs> 
and like messages from college students like hastily scrawled upon and taped onto the the cassette saying I'm missing my friend Jimmy or whatever like that watch it cuz the 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 and ultimate impetus of the story is to get somebody else to watch the cursed tape to lift it from yourself so yeah I've got a ton of those little <laughs> viral tapes ready to go and yeah just Things that I love throughout time, uh, little movies like Sam Raimi's uh, Crime Wave that he did with the Coen brothers, uh, just things that you know, aren't readily available elsewhere. And uh, for the most part, the little boutique companies are, are releasing a ton of the obscure titles, but there's still, there's still always something. Uh, music videos I love, like things like. David Lynch's Industrial Symphony Number no. One. Uh, I was a skateboarder. Who doesn't have that? Exactly. Uh, of skate videos, I have like uh, from back in the day when I, I thought I could uh, ride a skateboard, and now I would never attempt that. But I can live vicariously through the skateboarders and my VHS tapes. And uh, and yeah, the bootleg market was was crazy. Not to say that I purchased illegal videotapes, but uh, a yeah. lot of uh, duplicators were hiding behind this loophole from the Berne Convention in which if there was a, an alternate cut of a film that wasn't available in the United States uh, domestically, then you could replicate tapes and then charge a, a fee for replication or charge a fee for membership, and you weren't actually paying for the film itself technically. Uh, so that opened up a, a set of floodgates, <laughs> unleashing all these Hong Kong films and Italian films, and I've still got a number of those today. You know, Caitlin, I think also people are like baby ducks. They imprint on things that they see very early. So there's a generation, which does include my son. I mean, he he parted very reluctantly with his VHS tapes. He may still have them being some of them being stored somewhere. You know, it didn't make any difference to him at all whether they were available in some other format. There's a way in which for various tactile reasons, the VHS is satisfying to certain people. I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, it's the same way we're nostalgic for the bands that we loved in high school, right? They mean something to us because of who we were when we encountered them. And for me, and it sounds like I'm just a a few, well, okay, I'm a decade older than your son. But anyway, (laughs) (laughs) going to the video store and having the autonomy and the power to decide I'm going to watch all of Alfred Hitchcock's movies in alphabetical order because that's how I want to do it. And that's what I choose to do with my weekend, right? Like that was power. And it wasn't something that we were able to do before with any other format. And I don't think we've really been able to do it since, right? Like when you go to Netflix or you go to Mubi or whichever service you like, Eh, you kind of have to watch what they got the licensing rights store for. But the cool video stores, the independent video stores that I was going to uh, in Massachusetts when I was growing up, they had all of this stuff I'd never even heard of before. And these really cool guys behind the counter who would tell me about things I hadn't seen, but that I was going to love. Right. And we're going to come back to that as the show goes on. Uh, we, Sam and I were trying to pin down a couple of guys that we knew uh, way back when who fit that exact description. I do want to say, too, I just, I'll just i tell, tell you one quick story from the video source. When my son was six or seven, I had some errands to do, and I wanted him to come along with me, and we were going to stop by the woods and let our dogs out, and then I had to bring back a video and all this kind of stuff. And so he was six or seven, and he said, well, I only go if I could dress up as Robin and you dress up as Batman. And we had these costumes. I don't know why, but we did. <laughs> and so I agreed to that, and so we went and we walked the dogs, and that was very satisfying to him. And then it's night is beginning to fall. It's getting dark. And we turned in a different direction away from home. And he said, where are we going? I said, we have to go bring this video back, remember? And he said, yeah. So we go to Blockbuster's. And I start to get out of the car. He goes, you're not going in as Batman, are you? I said, I absolutely am. <laughs> and then, and he said, well, I was waiting here in the car. I said, you're only six years old. You can't wait in the car. So he like strips off his Robin costume and he comes with me and he's like hugging the walls, the outer walls of the store, creeping down. And I walked up to the desk and I had the video. I put it down and I said, uh, 
Good evening, gentlemen. And the two guys said, said, good evening, Batman. And I said, everything all right here? Pretty quiet evening? They said, yes, thank you, Batman. Thank you very much. And I could hear this little voice going, I don't believe this. (laughs) Um, But it was great to go into a video store as Batman. All right, so there's some things that, and both of you are going to talk about this, um, uh, that were almost kind of liabilities of the video format that became endearing. So, Caitlin, I'm going to have you set up pan and scan. Uh (laughs) But Sam, you can hear Sam's so ready to talk. Talk about pen and <laughs> my nemesis. <laughs> so once upon a time, you used to see a uh, warning at the beginning of all of your movies. You know this. Um this film has been uh, formatted to fit your screen. And uh, they would just lop off the left and right sides of a widescreen movie because this is hard to believe, kids, but back in the day, folks didn't like letterboxing, right? They felt like they were missing part of the image if there were black bars at the bottom of the tops of their screens. And they would prefer to actually miss the image instead of think that they might be missing the image. So some movies, I would argue, were actually improved by pan and scan. Um, I was reading an article by someone recently who was talking about the original Ghostbusters and how Bill Murray gets cut out of certain shots in that movie, which for this author sort of represented Bill Murray's actual involvement in the movie, that he was kind of (laughs) late to the project, that he wasn't there for some of the sequences he perhaps should have been there for. For me personally, I like the pan and scan version of Videodrome, maybe even more than the beautifully restored Criterion Collection DVD or Blu-ray. Sam, the floor is yours. Video drama is definitely a great choice for oh. one of the best films about videotape anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are a number of films that the aspect ratio of the theatrical exhibition isn't that hampered by videotape because there was those super wide cinemascope films you know, and, and 70 millimeter films that are, are trimmed uh, horribly. Uh, James Cameron called it image triage when it was squeezed onto a, a, a television that was – you know, four times as wide as it was uh, four times to three times the height. And uh, you couldn't fit a, a really, really wide image on there. But there are some films uh, that were matted theatrically. Uh, they were actually filmed on a, a film frame that was largely the same as uh, television screens, four to three. And sometimes they would just add mats onto those theatrically. And then you could theoretically, as a film transfer engineer, go back and just – not add those mats or, you know, just kind of have the whole film frame. Normally, people didn't do that. They still employed some sort of zooming or panning or scanning or something to that effect. But if it's not a film like Star Wars that, you know, demands to be seen super wide or Lawrence of Arabia, you can really get away with uh, having having those like a film like Batman Returns or Batman. Tim Burton didn't shoot those in, in CinemaScope or Panavision. So hmm. they play fine on VHS. We should say all of this stuff, all the nostalgia is now something that big companies are starting to think about. Because isn't like Urban Outfitters now selling VHS tapes and stuff like that? Yeah, so. they have those mystery uh, collections, right? <laughs> get, and they're, they're pretty expensive, too. I think they're around $40. And you get a, a pile of VHS tapes. They could be good. They could be bad. <laughs> All right. So I want to take a break. Caitlin, can you hang around for just a little while longer? Absolutely. Okay, because I, I think we we all need to talk about the video store, which is a thing. And uh, Hank Paper is going to be joining us for that. So let's take a break. We'll be back. Hey, let me borrow your car. I don't want to talk to you. Fine, just let me borrow your car. Why should I loan you my car? I want to rent a movie. You want to rent a movie? I want to rent a movie. What's that for? You work in a video store. I work in... 
video store. I want to go to a good video store so I can get a good movie. <laughs> That's from Clerks. And there were a bad movie store. That, I don't think the word was bad that was kick, uh, cut out there. But there are, were not so good movie store uh, movie stores. And there were great video stores. Uh, and they, were, they had people in them that you really wanted to talk to. One of those people. And that's Hank Paper, the former owner of Best Video in Hamden, and now a professor of film and television and media arts at Quinnipiac University. Sam Hatch, also still in the studio, co-host of The Culture Dogs on Sunday nights, 8 p.m., WWUH. Caitlin Benson Allen is with us, a distinguished associate professor of film and media studies at Georgetown University and author of Killer Tapes and Shattered Screens, Video Spectatorship from VHS to File Sharing. So, Caitlin, I, I wanted you here for this because I know that, you, I mean, you've already alluded to it, I think, the store that was in Lincoln, Massachusetts. But there was something about the experience of visiting that video store. If it was a good store with interesting people, that's a thing that is irretrievably lost, it seems. It's absolutely irretrievably lost. I go nuts on um, Netflix or any of mm-hmm. these websites with a recommendation algorithms. I was trying to find, you know, like just sort of one of those um old school comedies the other night, like a funny 80s comedy I hadn't seen. And uh, first they started recommending a million things I had seen. I was like, yeah, thanks. I I know about Caddyshack. Thanks for that. (laughs) And then they went from that to like just progressively dumber and dumber movies. And they couldn't control for taste or quality, right? That's what an algorithm can't do. There's nothing personal to it. An algorithm doesn't have a sense of humor. And I'm sure we've all had this frustration uh, with our various streaming services. But when I used to go to Lincoln Video or Chorus Line Video in Weston, Massachusetts, I knew the clerks there and they knew me and I could say, you know, like, I've seen this weird, crazy thing and I want more like it. And they'd ask me a couple questions and their taste and my taste would interact and we would have a moment Mm -hmm. and I still miss it. All right. So uh, one of those kinds of people is uh, or was or still is really (laughs) Hank Paper. Uh, So, Hank, uh, you came back from Hollywood to open a video store. I thought that was the correct segue for me (laughs) and looking for a different kind of life with my family on the East Coast, near our families. Um, And, you know, best video in all humility, I think, was and still is uh, the the best video store in the area, not to mention the only video store in the area. It's now a non-profit, which is how the remaining video stores in the country, such as Facets in Chicago, Vidiots in Santa Monica, or Scarecrow in Seattle, have continued on, which is as a non-profit. So we have a coffee bar, we have a performance space. But the thing that made this happen is what... (coughs) immediately struck me when the topic of VHS was raised. At first, I thought it was a funny idea, VHS, but really, it it, it then struck me as a symbol of a time that is lost, and, and you touched on it, Colin. But I have to say that the way Best Video became uh, such a... The, the way it attained its longevity for 33 years was the fact that it not only built its inventory of movies about which I knew something, so I was always anxious to add new movies to our collection, and there are about 40,000 movies now, but it was a meeting place. It's a place where neighbors could get together, they could talk about their lawns, they could talk about movies. I always hired staff who knew something about movies, usually teachers or artists, and Uh, not teeny boppers, no reflection on teeny boppers, but these are adults who could carry on conversations about movies and other things. So, Right, and you built up your collection a little bit differently. I mean, Sam, you grew up around a video store. Your dad was uh, managing uh, video stores. And and how it worked was, uh, as I understand it anyway, you'd get like, you know, umpty, umpty, um copies of Raiders of the mm-hmm. Lost Ark or something when it came out, and they all cost like $180 per copy. <laughs> they were expensive. And, yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then you'd rent them for $10 until people got tired of them, and you didn't need to own as many, and then you'd, you know, they'd get all marked down and be sold off way, way uh, later. Um, 
Uh, I mean, that's basically the the model, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the model. Yeah, they were they were wickedly expensive. Uh, if people think about the sell through tapes that right. eventually started hitting the market. They were about but, ninety dollars. Yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe but, more. But you can yeah. make your money off of them if if they were a hot new title. So right. yeah, they, the, the uh, impulse was to buy as many as possible and stock your shelves while they were hot. Mm. And yeah. then yeah, eventually you would have that yard sale or something and throw a bunch on the table out front. Well, and, and, you, know. you know, the policy as I discovered when I was traveling around and felt the need the end to watch a movie i walked into a blockbuster and i i asked for this tv series whose whose name eludes me it's not important but i wanted to watch this tv series that people were recommending and they directed me to a portion of the sprawling store store and i only found the final season so i went up to the clerk and i said well I, I'm interested in this series, but I'd like to start at the beginning, not at season seven. <laughs> and they said, oh, we get rid of all of our yep. copies, you know, when the new season comes out. And I was so appalled because <laughs> my uh, my methodology was to never get rid of anything, to rather to build an archive. I mean, we have a lot of VHS still remaining at, at Best Video. Mm-hmm. And I say we... In the royal sense or something. I mean, it's a nonprofit now. I go there and have coffee every morning. You're, and I help you're them a, order you're movies, emeritus, but, as they say in academia, right? <laughs> um, but, so, but Video Get Galaxy, Blockbuster, oh. they catered to the most, the currently most popular films, mm-hmm. and and damn the rest, they just swept the shelves of them. Although, so Caitlin, I don't know if you had this experience or not. I had the experience of, yeah, you'd be walking around maybe one of those stores if there was nothing else nearby, and you'd be looking and looking and looking, kind of what you were doing on Netflix, but looking like where's something that I haven't seen? And every once in a while, your hands would close around this thing. And I remember my son and I, he was older by this time, but uh, we, we wound up pulling out this movie, and we didn't know what it was, and we looked at the cover and we didn't recognize anybody on it but I think it had some, maybe some good reviews and some of those little film festival symbols and we took it home and we watched it and we were completely blown away now the movie was Bottle Rocket Wes Anderson's oh, first movie, movie. But, yeah. Yeah, but nobody knew who Wes Anderson or Luke Wilson or mm-hmm. Owen Wilson or any of those people were and Caitlin that kind of thrill too that serendipitous location of a movie I mean we just became Wes Anderson fa- fans from then till now but finding that thing that you didn't know about either because a smart yeah. clerk sent you there, or I, I'm sure you have your own version of that. Well, video stores... Well, I was gonna, I, this yeah. is like Caitlin yeah. answered. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. So my version of that um, is the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover, which just had this mm-hmm. amazing poster with Helen Mirren, and I had <laughs> never heard of it. I was, frankly, way too young to have rented that movie on my own. Um, but But I saw the poster, I was compelled, and I feel like there was this sort of democratic spirit among the tapes in the video store, right? They're all roughly the same size. There's not that much variation between uh, the styles of boxes. They're all next to each other, especially if you go into the genre sections, right? Everything in in horror kind of looked pretty much like everything else in horror. So um, so whether I'm taking home, you know, like Zombie 2 and encountering like the amazing master of um, of Italian uh, splatter, or um, I'm grabbing something else that maybe I've I've never heard of, like Diabolique, right? And all of a sudden, I'm learning about mm. French horror films, and I didn't necessarily mean to grab it, but there's just <laughs> that that opportunity. And I think you also kind of had more buy-in than when you were streaming, right? Like now, if I start something on Netflix and I'm five or ten minutes in, and I'm like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I just go and get something else. But right. if I paid my three ninety five at Lincoln Video and I'd have to go all the way back downtown to get another tape, then I <laughs> tended to stick around and finish the movie, which people don't really do the same way anymore. Absolutely, absolutely the case. And Sam, there were also staff picks in some places, I right? miss the staff picks. That was the delightful thing. Yeah. That, that started to go away a little bit in the era of Blockbuster where they, they would hire the kids that – weren't really movie buffs per se, and they were just there to run the registers, et cetera. But the, the great stores that were curated had a nice uh, catalog. 
they would have some great staff picks. And then, yeah, I would run into films like The Reflecting Skin from director Philip Ridley <laughs> that I never would have encountered otherwise. And it had that striking image on the cover of this young boy with a harpoon across his lap and this whalebone uh, jaw set on a wall behind him. And it ended up being this like really fascinating Viggo Mortensen film about uh, the loss of innocence. And it's it's a really beautiful mm. film. And I would never would have encountered that otherwise. And you know, films like Delicatessen or City of Lost Children would always be on the staff picks uh, yes. shelves. And, and once you found that you had a similar taste with one particular right, staff exactly. member, you can go back and, and raid his selection again a week later. And Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sure you want to react to that, Hank. Well, we had stickers also. Each staff person had a sticker with his or her own caricatured image on it and mm-hmm. a, a different color. So uh, I... A customer would readily get to identify uh, his taste with a particular staff person's taste. And who you could go to that staff, staff person and say, well, what came out? What do you recommend? But it's a way of, of, of customers readily identifying movies with those stickers that they would probably enjoy. The thing about VHS, which in my mind represents the video era, 30 period, say, from 1980 to 2010, is that this was a time when people were exposed to films as never before. From kids, older people, conversations about films, they could learn about films. If you had VHS, you could even play with it a little and record something on that VHS. Sometimes we would get tapes back where the customer has <laughs> taped over it, we would be outraged. But that was the the nature of the media. It was a people's medium, uh, VHS. But the exposure to film was incredible, and it allowed kids to skirt parental control. Yes. But the thing about <laughs> yeah. VHS as an era <laughs> that has disappeared, it, it was ritualistic. You would go to the video store, maybe with your family on a Friday night, you would go through, you would choose a film, you would go home, and you would all watch it together on, on the same screen, namely your TV. Now, there are multiple screens. Right. People, people you people, know, most yeah, of my students. Together. It's yeah. true. It's most true. Of my, I, well, I asked them, I took a poll. Most of my students watch their movies on their cell phones, yeah. which yeah. I find appalling, but that's... There are multiple screens. People watch films alone. Absolutely. It's no longer the collective intake of the image on the screen that started speaking, with the darkened movie. Speaking of, in, of yeah. intakes, Caitlin, I, I heard an intake of breath or an exhalation when Hank mentioned no parental control. <laughs> were you one of those kids who were getting, getting movies you weren't supposed to be watching? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, even before there was Lincoln Video, there was just a, a VHS shelf uh, at the convenience store in my tiny little town that would rent movies for a dollar, which was about what my allowance was when I was like six, seven, eight. And I would go and get all kinds of things that, uh, well, in hindsight, maybe they weren't appropriate. On the other hand, I ended up a film professor. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the story has a happy ending. Appropriate. Yeah. Right. You know, I have to say that uh, that... The ritualistic nature of a bygone era, which is the VH era, wasn't only going to the store and watching a film with your family, but you could not have a sleepover as a kid without a movie, usually a horror movie to watch. Mm-hmm. You could not have a, holly, uh, a, a, a holiday event like Thanksgiving. A Thanksgiving, you sat there for a while, or pa- even a Passover Seder, you got after a while. You got tired of looking at the Uncle Harry's nostril hairs, and you knew it was time to put on the movie. You would gather around. Well, that's, was, that's a great John Candy movie, Uncle, Uncle Harry's nostril hairs. <laughs> I think it's but kind it was of a underrated. part of every holiday gathering that there would be a movie yeah. in attendance. Yep. As an option, which most people and now took. everyone's put out. If you bring a film, if you bring a Blu-ray to an event, everyone's yeah. like, "Ah, oh, we're not going to watch that. Why'd you bring that?" And <laughs> we're just we going to look at our phones later. That's right. We only yes, our phones right, in fight. Exactly. All right, we're going to have to take a little break here. I, before we take a break, let me just tell, tell you one quick thing. And I, I may get parts of this story wrong. This is something that maybe is not so happy that came out of this whole phenomenon, which is that uh, Caitlin just made me think of it. But uh, Barney, the kids' TV show Barney, started kind of through this station right where I'm sitting, and the way that it happened was. 
was a guy who worked at the station or a guy who now works for the New York Times. They, they were friends. Their kids hung out together. One of them found a Barney tape in a gas station that had videos. And it turned out there were just like, like this couple from Texas that were making the videos and somehow they're getting them pretty much by hand, I think, anywhere they could get them to. And these guys, they, they showed the Barney videos to their kids and the kids flipped out over the thing. And before you knew it, Barney was a TV show on public television emanating uh, out of here. So <laughs> so there you go. You never know what's going to be on the video you get at the gas station. We're going to take a little break. We're going to thank uh, Caitlin so much uh, for her contributions uh, here today. Thanks to uh, Caitlin benson Allett, a distinguished associate professor of Georgetown at Georgetown University, author of Killer Tapes and Shattered Screens, Video Spectatorship from VHS to File Sharing. Let's take a little break. We'll be right back. listen to today's show, please rewind it for the next customer. Today's show is produced by the Mejia Soros, coming soon to VHS in Mejia Soros 4, Death of Littlefoot, and by me, Kyone Wolf. The Mejia Soros is listed only for non-commercial use in private homes. Any public performance or other use is strictly prohibited. The part of Bill Curry was played by Max Hedrum. And now, back to Colin. With me, Hank Paper, former owner of Best Video in Hampton, professor of film and television and media arts at Quinnipiac University. Sam Hatch, co-hosting The Culture Dogs on Sunday nights at WWUH, 8 o'clock. So, Sam, uh, before – one thing that I think we haven't talked about, uh, and one of the reasons we haven't talked about it is, as you were sort of alluding to, it wasn't maybe 100 percent legal. But there was (laughs) – a kind of look that the stepped on videotape, the copied videotape had that was kind of thrilling. It wasn't a precise image, but you realized that you had something that you weren't really supposed to have. Yeah, and there are people now that that are, have this kind of expectation when they see a certain glitch on a tape, they know that it's a scene that someone watched many, many times. So <laughs> yeah. there's usually nudity or extreme violence right. following <laughs> yes. shortly thereafter. And right. yeah, now in all sorts of video editing suites, they have these these VHS effects that you can add on there. And there's plenty of people making music videos, et cetera, that are added. They, they never quite get it just right. There's something to be said for an actual videotape. And you can never quite recreate that with an after effect. You know, yeah. Uh, you, you know, there's something about looking not back with VHS, but looking ahead VHS as a medium was succeeded by DVDs and then Blu-rays and then and somewhere there in laser discs and then pay uh, movies on demand and then streaming. So there's an evolution. Each iteration of medium leaves behind a certain number of movies mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that are no longer available. So that exposure to film is diminished. So what you wind up with is the allotment of movies on, say, Netflix, which Mm. really is pretty paltry. They just took off Godfather, for instance, which I assigned last semester. I can't assign it this semester. It's gone. How are people going to have access to the Godfather? And on VHS, you can actually get the Godfather trilogy that was cut alternatively to go chronologically. So you can watch the three films in chronological order, mixed and matched. It's not available on Blu-ray or DVD. I was going to ask you that, uh, Hank, also. I mean, there were some films that didn't make it to VHS or were a long time. I I think that one of them was the Richard Lester Three Musketeers, which I was a big fan of, the one with Mm -hmm. Michael uh, York and Oliver Reed and all those people. Yeah, good film. And there was a copy of of a VHS of it at a video store in Stores, Connecticut. And my son and I drove all the way, 40 (laughs) minutes to Stores. Was it the right version? I think, well, well, it was that movie, but I feel like... Like it's 
its provenance may I mean somehow or other you know I, it, it may have been sort of a bootleg movie that they had yeah. that they were they were letting us rent it, but yeah. um, but were there frustrations for you like movies that you really wanted to be able to rent at best but they just didn't well, make it well on VHS? DVD for instance with the passing of VHS <clears throat> No longer are we able to see Looking for Mr. Goodbar. Yeah, yeah, she mentioned or, that too, yeah. Or Ken Russell's The Devils. Mm. Or uh, Haunting Julia with Mia Farrow. Mm. Um, so with each iteration of medium toward ones and twos, namely nothing, you know, you, you, streaming, what is streaming? It, you can't have a collection of streaming yep. movies. It's a little... You know, the medium is disappearing, and one reason why collectors like VHS is because it's something you, you could put in your hands, and through these glitches you could keep in touch with your particular tribe of video VHS collectors. But it leaves more and more films behind as uh, through the evolution of, uh, of medium types until you get to the ones and twos of of downloading movies, of streaming movies. It's like uh, Facebook. It's where we're at in our lives. We're in our separate screens. We don't know what the source is. We don't, we can't hold our privacy in our hands just like we can't hold a VHS tape in our hands. So we're in a totally different place of isolated, multiple isolating screens. It's, uh, you know, when I start out teaching my class, the very first thing I say is that this class is outmoded because the history of film developed in a darkened theater where people collectively were watching movies. But now, what do movies mean? How do they affect society given our current um, current digital digital age? They don't even I, shoot movies on film anymore. Hey, we've got a call coming in here from uh, Michael. How are you? We're fine. Well, what I wanted to say is I'm actually a, a film producer, and I produce the, the Gremlins movies. Wow. And on Gremlins 2, I don't know if anybody remembers that. Oh, classic. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sequence where the film breaks. Yes. It, it was sort of a meta thing that we did where the movie is playing, and then all of a sudden, it, and this, of course, is now ac- anachronistic because it's all digital. But the the, fil- the the film freezes. There's like bubbling, and you know, like it's melting, and then it breaks, and then you see shadows of gremlins on the screen. And the idea was that the gremlins got into the projection booth. So you're sitting in a theater, and the gremlins are the projection booth, <laughs> and then the, then the. The projectionist comes down. He's all covered with film, uh, and the and the theater owner comes out, and then um, uh, uh, Hulk Hogan gets up from the audience and yells at the Gremlins <laughs> to stop this, right? Mm-hmm. And then the film continues. Well, when we went to VHS, obviously that doesn't work because you're not you're at home watching this on VHS. So we actually talked Warner Brothers into reshooting uh, that part of the movie, and we we got a clip of John Wayne. Uh, shooting, uh, and then we cut to the Gremlins, and then we did we we got Chad Everett on a, with this actor who happened to, to be yes. really good at doing John Wayne impressions. Because we, we had to call Michael Wayne, John Wayne's son, to get permission to use this mm. clip. And he said, "Call." He said, "We we need somebody to do John Wayne's voice to yell at the Gremlins off camera." So he said, "Chad Everett does an incredible uh, John Wayne." So we so we brought in, in Chad Everett, and we actually inserted this separate sequence for, for VHS only. All right. That's the first time I've talked thought about Chad Everton in a really long time. But he was the star of some <laughs> he was the star of some doctor show. I can't remember what, what uh, show Michael it was. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Michael. That's a, a, a great great phone call. Uh, and thanks very much. We're kind of running out of time here. We only have um, a, a couple of minutes left. But um, but Sam, yes. uh, I'm also thinking: are there are there VHSs that you still wish you could get? Yeah, I mean, there's still some titles that I would definitely pick up, even if it's something I have on Blu-ray. Like if I ran across like Deadbeat at Dawn, a crazy film from this guy, Jim Van Beber from Ohio. <laughs> and I can't even describe the film. It's about a gang leader, I guess, that all kind of dabbles in the supernatural with his girlfriend and, and is just uh, – it's just mind exploding <laughs> totally nonsense and totally violence. And if I found that on VHS, yeah. I would pick it up immediately. And of course, if I ever run across anything, 
You know, that kind of like matches the the vibe, like video drum. Obviously, right. if I trip across that in a flea market, I'm picking it up in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, by the way, Chad Everett was the star of Medical Center. I'm being told. Medical so, Center. Yes. So there you go. So um, uh, as we close here, Hank, um, I know that this is a, a quote that you've used too. You know that McLuhan said the medium is the message. There's something about the medium of VHS. It's what we've been trying to get at here. The medium itself is the message VHS and. You know, at the end of this terrific DVD called Rewind This about a group of Great VHS film. collectors, they decide at the end that they would get a tattoo, a realistic yes. black and white tattoo on their arms. And around this realistic image of a tattoo, it is a call to arms, is a ribbon. And the two words on that ribbon are never forget. <laughs> because it means keep close. It is a call to arms to keep close to you what is important to you, what is precious and uh, never let that disappear. Hmm. And I, I just want to mention one other thing about, about VHS, got which about is 30, definitely a touchstone. Got about 30 seconds left. Okay, three words. Be kind, rewind. Hmm. Yes. A kind of zen cone. Absolutely. So I, I was also thinking that uh, when uh, a, a YouTube video gets scrubbed off when, where it's embedded in a website, mm-hmm. the symbol is this kind of grainy thing with two wheels. The symbol <laughs> of the thing that you lost is actually, it looks like a, a, a video cassette. And I think that is a significant thing. We've, we've alluded to it. But one thing about video cassettes is you, nobody can take them away from you. Mm-hmm. They can't disappear from YouTube because somebody sued somebody. You know, you've got it. All right. Well, great guest here. Great work by Carlos Mejia. The Mejia Soros, thanks to Sam Hatch uh, and to Hank Paper. Uh, and uh, thanks to Caitlin, uh, who is just amazing. Joining us, Caitlin Benson Allett, her book, Killer Tapes and Shattered Screens.